So before I start this video, three little things. One, this is a fancy George Lucas-esque re-re-release of a previous video I've made, this time with far more context, elaboration, midichlorians, etc., and this time it also has better audio quality. Two, there are spoilers here. Buy and play through Hotline Miami before you watch this video with emphasis on buy. Please, oh please, purchase this game and play through it. It's made by two awesome, crazy Swedish guys who deserve your money, and if you have no interest in purchasing this game, look at pictures of dolphins or whatever, because this video isn't going to be of any interest to you. Three, this video is just a topic-by-topic -topic list of few concepts I find worth talking about. It's not an in-depth narrative analysis or anything like that, although I definitely like to say that in no uncertain terms that Campster is completely wrong about what the developers intended to say with this game, and I have proof in the form of an interview with the developers themselves. Follow the link down below. Of course, you can argue that author intent is irrelevant, but you can argue a lot of things. I can argue that your high school art teacher that you probably learned that bullshit from was most likely a meth addict. Hotline Miami, for all its neon-soaked, heavily stylized, pixelated psychedelia, is disturbingly realistic when it comes to its depiction of violence. While most games are content to set their combat systems within a logic-free bubble, one where taking multiple 9mm rounds to the head is totally survivable, Hotline Miami takes a far more distressing route. If characters are shot, they'll die instantly, and when characters are struck with blunt weapons, sometimes they'll die on impact, and sometimes they'll be left bloodied but not damaged enough to not try and crawl away. And if characters are punched, they'll be knocked over until the deed can be finished, usually by smashing their heads against a gaudy linoleum tile floor until the back of their skull cracks open. Of course, as you can see, Hotline Miami is heavily stylized, so notation sounds a lot worse than depiction, but that ties into the topic of disassociation, and we're not quite there yet. Anyway, in order to be allowed to exit a stage, literally every living thing inside the building you've been assigned, dogs included, must die horribly at your hands, and you'll kill them, but more importantly, your player character will kill them. You see, as a player, what do those fictional, faceless, featureless, pixelated, bald men mean to you, and what does it matter if you kill them? I hope it's a resounding nothing, because it doesn't and shouldn't matter if you kill them. They don't exist and never will, and just because their sprite now lays scattered on the ground surrounded by a big, bright red pool of pixel blood doesn't make them any more dead than they were before you started playing the game. This goes for all media, interactive or not, and there should be no shame in enjoying the violence in a Tarantino movie, for instance, because it's not real violence. It's a stylized, fictional Personalized representation of violent acts, intentionally warped or inserted into a context where watching it is made enjoyable or at the very least tolerably unpleasant. The same applies here, but since Hotline Miami is a piece of linear interactive media which often run on parallel lines of logic, the player's interactivity, and the game's narrative devices, certain concessions must be made. More often than not in games, these aspects are left separate and sometimes jarringly contrast, causing narrative dissonance, but in Hotline Miami there is no dissonance between the interactivity and the narrative narrative devices, because by and large, the interactivity counts as the narrative devices. Within the boundaries of the game's narrative logic, the people being massacred en masse by the player characters are living human beings who have themselves done little, if anything, to warrant their fates. As characters, what do you think those living human beings mean to Jacket and Biker, and what do you think it matters to them if they kill them? Perhaps they see them the same way you do, as faceless and nameless non-entities whose fates matter very little. Oh look, I drew a parallel. Jacket is in many ways a cipher, but he's a cipher with an illustrative purpose. Take for example the question scene, wherein four questions are presented to Jacket by three masked figures representative of his fractured psyche and his restless conscience. They're as follows. One, do you like hurting other people? Two, who's leaving messages on your answering machine? Three, where are you right now? And four, why are we having this conversation? These questions aren't without a purpose. Players are prompted to question both the motivation and sanity of the character they're playing as, something a surprising amount of players wouldn't normally do. The questions are being asked to the player as well as the character, but not in the manner that Campster implies. The questions aren't there to be answered, they're there to be asked. Why does he voluntarily don animal masks and break into mob hideouts and butcher literally every living thing inside with anything he can get his hands on? Why does he follow the vague order sent to him by the mysterious titular hotline and the elusive 50 blessings? Is he some sort of a patriot, a psychopath, both? Who is this man and why is he doing what he's doing? The answers, of course, are only partially revealed, and while Jacket later does acquire a clear motive, and the secondary protagonist, Biker, starts out with clear intentions, the primary question of their initial motivation to sign on with the 50 blessings in the first place remains unanswered. But do you think it really needs to be? Maybe they just thought killing would be fun. Didn't you think it was fun?
Oh look, I drew another parallel. Basically, it's this. You, the player, enjoyed the violence because of its presentation, its aesthetics, its kinesthetics, and its design. Jacket enjoyed the killing because, well, he's insane. Biker also enjoyed the killing because, well, he's insane. Really, the only reason he ever wanted to get out of the 50 blessings in the first place is because it stopped being fun for him. Literally, he wanted to stop playing the game. Man, this got really deep really quick. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy this video of my novelty pink flamingo. It settles the mind and eases the soul. The scoring system in Hotline Miami is something of a parody, a poignantly and comedically recontextualized carryover from the arcade days Hotline affectionately embraces. The system in question consists of giving the player a numerical and then later a letter-based score centered around mostly undefined and sometimes outright nonsensical intangibles like mobility and flexibility which, on release before the game was patched, was always scored at zero, which only serve as setups to the ultimate punchline when the scoring system inevitably hands the player a thousands of points above the maximum score in a nine legible, swaying, nauseatingly saturated green typeface. This baffling, albeit actually functional scoring system, like many other absurdist elements of Hotline Miami, is not without a purpose. It serves as a fourth wall breaker of sorts, a fragment of seemingly irrelevant design that has all the relevance in the world. This extends beyond mere scores though. Confusion, unsettling design, and disassociation permeate nearly every aspect of Hotline Miami's design, from the confusing to disturbing inter-level non-combat sections to the dreamlike haze that surrounds every level, to the more important things like the animal masks which serve as another parallel. This time a three-way parallel between Jacket, his choice of mask, and the player. I don't need to say this myself though, so I'll leave you with a word from the developers themselves. Incorporated a whole like, if you have an animal mask it becomes an animal and animals don't have to be responsible for their own actions because they are mm -hmm. animals. If they kill something it's natural. Yeah. So, so for him, putting on an animal mask makes him makes him into an animal. So he doesn't, it's not responsible for what he's doing. It's the animal yeah. that does it. I like so also, maybe that's, yeah, and that's why we gave them names as well, to like, like, what's it called? Give him a, yeah. a distance himself from what he's doing, so he becomes a different personality. Yeah, he becomes called the locust. He's not himself. It's called the locust that kills everyone. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh, so just like a video game. game. Yeah, like when you play a video game, I didn't do it, Nico Bellic killed all those. Hotline Miami isn't Spec Ops The Line. It doesn't hypocritically condemn violent player interaction, it incorporates it into a stream-of-consciousness abstract art piece that says far more about both character-driven psychopathy and player-based interactive pseudo-violence than a hundred railroaded guilt trips ever can. It's at times a wholesomely difficult to enjoy experience, full of abstract, disturbing content, relentless violence, jarring lapses in logic, and otherwise odd or profane content, but it's there because it needs to be there, and it's there because it makes the game better. It's there because it makes the story better and it's there because hopefully it has the potential to make some people think about games a little better.